supporting the two-state solution is very similar to supporting or to denying global warming. It is um, unsustained by the facts. If you really believe in um, this country, if you really care about this country, you better believe that stating the truth about it is necessary. The country doesn't need lies. It needs the truth so that it can become better. You will not make apartheid go by, by just um, killing the term, just as you're not going to make the occupation go uh, by killing the term. If there is a danger to Israeli democracy because of the Ausnahme Zustand when Bibi is in power. And I said, just imagine that the AfD was in government in Germany and just announced officially an Ausnahme Zustand and said that the, uh, um, um, the parliament um, can no longer practice its, uh, um, um, can no longer oversee the actions of the government. Would you think that there is a, um, um, a danger to German democracy? Being committed to Jews, being committed to their history, by um, being genuinely committed to universalism, democracy, and liberalism. This is not simple, it's not easy, um, it's not um, always comfortable, because I understand that it's uncomfortable for some Germans to criticize Israel, for good reasons. Who said it needs to be comfortable to be German? So, eine neue Folge Jung und Naiv. Wir sind zurück im Ozzolot und ich spreche mit jemandem, den ich noch nicht kenne. Wer bist du? Omri Böhm, um, originally Israeli, um, teaching philosophy at the New School for Social Research for uh, 10 years now. Um, writing on Kant, early modern philosophy and sometimes about Israel. So it's probably interesting to some listeners that I ask you in German, but you understand me, yet you answer in English. How come you understand German? I didn't even notice that you asked me in German, interestingly enough. Um, I do speak German, but uh, for interviews of this length, I prefer to speak English to be on the safe side. Prinzipiell könnten wir das auch auf Deutsch machen, aber ich denke, wir machen das auf Englisch. How come you speak German? Well, I have a German grandmother, also grand a German grandfather, but um, whom I didn't know. Um, my German grandmother taught me to love the language, but she didn't teach me the language. Um, I learned the language later when I went to Yale, um, and I took German classes. Originally, yeah, originally in order to read Kant in German. Then I went to Heidelberg for a year, and in Heidelberg habe ich mein, Letz, mein Herz verloren, und um, so habe ich auch Deutsch gelernt. Uh, where did you grow up? In Israel, in the Galilee, on a very small place originally with 15 families, maybe not even, um, in the north part of the country, almost on the, on the border to Lebanon. We're talking about the early 80s. I then moved to Tel Aviv to study philosophy in Tel Aviv, and then I went to the US. What did you want to study philosophy? Like, didn't, didn't you have like a dream after you uh, finished with school? Like, did you, want, did you always want to become a philosopher? Or? Did you have to go to the military? I did have to go to the military, and I did go to the military. And what happened is that when I was in the military, I wrote a short book. And the book was called The Binding of Isaac, A Religion Model of Disobedience. You see, we're doing now promotion for a completely different book. And um, when I wrote this, it's a different long story, but when I wrote that book, I um, discovered a philosopher named Son Kierkegaard who has famously wrote about the binding of Isaac as well. And I started reading Son Kierkegaard and I got into philosophy. And very quickly I went from Kierkegaard, who was very different from Kant in so many ways. I, I discovered my love of Kant. Did you love going or being in the military? Like, did you have to go for three, three years? years? Three yeah. years. It was the end of the 90s? It was the end of the 90s. After Oslo? It was after Oslo. Oslo was... Um, doing well back then. Mm -hmm. It collapsed really just when I was, immediately after I was released. Be um, because of you, maybe. Yeah. Maybe because I left. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Um, 
I cannot say that I loved going to the military, but I did not oppose it as much as I do today. Um, I was a good soldier, you can say easily, um, always on the left, always a good liberal Zionist, like so many uh, Israelis. I don't know if you, I know that you've been to Israel and I know that you've spoken to many people, but um, there is a paradox there. Perhaps it's changing with the years. Often um, the people who are on the left, the people who are the most critical of the situation, are also coming from the families that are also the most Zionist. So often you get those, this is more famous, say, um, the pilot's letter, right? So the, uh, the letter of the people who went to the special forces, the letter of the people who were pilots, write letters opposing the occupation, opposing this or that campaign against the Palestinians or in Lebanon and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think I fit relatively well into this category of, um, at least I used to fit relatively well into this category of um, people who are definitely very critical of the occupation and of Israel, but are still um, committed to their country and also went to the military and uh, did a very, what Israelis call a meaningful military service. What um, was your job? My job is not something that uh, people should discuss. Um, yeah. Like secret, secret service stuff? Or yes. Secret military stuff? Um, I think I can say so that much because it's already written in the book. Um, um, it was not in the military. It wasn't the um, uh, secret service. And um, that's also why I prefer not to discuss it. Did you ever have to use your gun? Have you ever been in touch with the occupied people in the Palestinian territories? Absolutely. How was that? That was unpleasant, and I think that the realization that you're doing great violence, violence in the, well, violence is never abstract, but violence not in the sense of uh, drawing blood was very clear. Um, I did belong to a unit that, let's say, is um, operative, definitely. On the other hand, you don't have to use your gun. If you use your gun, this means that something went terribly wrong, mm -hmm. and that did not happen uh, in my time. But no doubt, I've done wrong things when I was in the military. I remember uh, we talked to Yehuda Shaul like, uh, from Breaking the Silence, and he talked about his time in Hebron. Uh, the, I think a few years later, after you went to the military, and he was like, 90% of his actions as a soldier, he's ashamed of. He, they were immoral. What about you? I'm not sure that I would put it in the same terms. Um, well, he did something else, like he was on the ground in Hebron. I'm sure I've done things that are, not, that are at least as bad in, in many ways. But I think about it differently. Look, um, the fact... Yeah, look, I've done things that I'm also proud of, of in the military. Not everything that I've done um, I consider to be uh, wrong. The problem is in the participation in a certain type of structure, which is wrong, which is the structure of the occupation, which is violent in itself. That structure um, I'm not proud of belonging to or having been belonging to. This is, by the way, uh, to just take it... Um, slightly sideways. That's also my problem with an organization like Breaking the Silence. And um, people at the top at Breaking the Silence know this and tend to agree with me. The problem is that Breaking the Silence often precisely like to play on the fact that they did the military service in order to be legitimate as uh, speakers, as people who speak against the occupation. That's part of the problem with this organization because part of the problem in Israel today, this is not something that's familiar, I think, for, to German audience. Part of the problem is that really there is a question of legitimacy. Who is allowed to speak? Does a is a Palestinian allowed to speak? Is someone who didn't go to the military allowed to speak? Well, obviously, right? Obviously, they should be equal. Obviously, they should be allowed to speak regardless of whether they went to the military or not, or regardless of whether they are Jewish or not. We should not reinforce the logic that we are allowed to speak because we went to the military. Breaking the silence does 
extraordinary work, very important, because they tell Israelis about many things that they do not want to hear. On the other hand, they reinforce the logic of we were in the military, so we are allowed to speak. We speak as soldiers. Um, that's, uh, there's a catch there. There's a problem there. And I think my suspicion is, um, I think I'm speaking, uh, I have reasons to think that uh, people there often understand it. And that in a way, breaking the silence needs to become more radical. Um, more radical? More radical, because they I mean, need they are, to... They are for ending the occupation? They should be for ending the occupation. People, sh they should be speaking not as former soldiers. They should be speaking as citizens. It's extremely important, this is a big part of my book, by the way, to um, rehabilitate a certain um, ability, a certain concept of citizenship in Israel. Israel does not have a strong concept of citizenship. First, because it's such a militarized society. Second, because it is a Jewish state, and in a Jewish state, being Jewish is more important than being a citizen. People belong to the state because they're Jewish, not just in virtue of citizenship. The first political task in Israel today is to rehabilitate a certain robust, proud concept of citizenship. Breaking the silence, again, doing in so many ways important, courageous, wonderful work, They speak as soldiers, as former soldiers. Let us speak as citizens. So, you mentioned that you were, like, when you came to the military, you were, like, a normal liberal Zionist. How did, how did you grow up? Like, you were born after the occupation started. The occupation started in 67. You were born in 1997. 79. No, 79, sorry. Yeah. How, were you, how, how were you raised um, while... Israel occupied the Palestinian territories. Like, I don't what, think what, did, what did you learn? Did they did they call? Did your parents call? Your teachers call it occupation? What did they teach you? Two things. When I was um, um, very young, the occupation was not an issue at all. What was the issue was the first Lebanon war. My first memories, literally, I think my first memories as a child, have to do with my father going and coming back from the first Lebanon war. We don't need to speak about my biography so much. Later on, in the late 80s, early 90s, I, be I grew up. I was, what, 10 and older. And something else happened. The first intifada broke up, broke out. And this is when uh, the fact of the occupation became uh, very clear also to people who were not thinking about it before. My parents definitely were of the type who were always critical of the occupation. My parents both belonged to the people who in 68 said that you have to um, establish a Palestinian state and that the occupation is a disaster. We had absolutely no doubt about this in where I grew up. However, as I said, extremely patriotic, extremely Zionist. My father is a, a captain in the uh, military in reserve. Uh, my mother is a major in reserve. Wow. Um, people who are, you know, in the very conscious Zionist, but on the left. Um, the occupation became an issue with the first intifada. Before that, I think that a lot of people believed in a crazy idea that's called the enlightened occupation. The enlightened occupation. They believed, you know, this is... I'm not big on colonialist and post-colonialist language, but this is really colonialist language. They really believe that, in a way, um, the best thing that happened to the Palestinians is that they will be um, ruled by Jews. Look, um, look at the Arab countries around us. Um, we have a prosperous, uh, democratic, first world country. Um, true, they do not vote to parliament. True, they do not have their own... Um, um, national sovereignty and so forth, but it's even better for them to be controlled by Jews and not by, uh, say, Egypt. Uh, it's better for them to be repressed by the Israeli secret service and not by the Egyptian muhabarat. By the way, 
That later statement, I'm not sure, is even completely false. It is possible that it's better to be interrogated by the Secret Service of Israel um, uh, than by uh, the Muhabarat, um, say the Egyptian one. Um, I think it's not a, I mean, it's a very, it's the wrong type of competition who is worse there. But there was this conviction. The occupation is uh, good to the Palestinians. With the first intifada, um, we started to discover that um, the Palestinians actually don't think so, and that they're willing to, uh, um, to go to fight over it. Through that emerged, of course, the famous and now infamous two-state solution, because the Oslo process emerged from the first intifada. And through those political discussions with which I grew up as a teen, you know, in my teens they were happening, 93 and so forth, um, I came to think, to realize that there is an occupation that became the language. When, when was the first time that you were in the occupied territories? Like as a soldier? Or did you like visit where you were allowed to go? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, because it, it shows us how... It shows us how complicated facts are. I was in the occupied territory as a very young child already, and I'll tell you why. Because I went to the Wailing Wall, I went to East Jerusalem with my parents and my grandparents, probably when I was a baby, mm -hmm. definitely when I was four and five. Um, and to be sure, my family even goes back to those places. Um, half of my family, um, um, well, a quarter of my family is from the old city of Jerusalem, something that's very uncommon for Jews mm -hmm. in the country. Uh, so in a way, we're going back to a place that uh, my family has been in for decades. Still, this is legally occupied land. It's not perceived as occupied territory, definitely not by Israelis, even not by Israelis on the left. And the international community is a little bit on the fence there. When we speak about the occupied territories, we speak about Gaza back then, about Gaza, we speak about Hebron, the West Bank, and so forth. So the question is... Like they always they, forget about East Jerusalem. For example, uh, they, they forget about um, parts of the road to Jerusalem. Uh, part of it are you know, on occupied territory. This is actually important because I suggest we remain clear on what's occupied territory in order to resist the um, tendency to legitimize the occupation. We need to be clear on what's occupied and what's not. So to answer you directly, I was in occupied territory from when I was still a baby, probably. I was in what is perceived as occupied territory. When was the first time? I'm not sure. Certainly by the time I was a soldier, I was. Um, I don't think that I crossed the border much before. My family was not the type that would have friends in settlements. Um, look, this is, uh, those are personal issues, but I can say this. My wife, for example, um, uh, has large parts of her family who are proud. I think this can be said because they are proud settlers. My wife definitely grew up going all the time to the occupied territories and sitting in settlements. This is not some, I mean, she is against the settlements, just to be sure. Um, she loves her family. But um, you can have very different experiences growing up in Israel. I came from a place where the occupied territories were occupied territories, and one did not go there. Um, one went to Jerusalem. Have you ever, ever been to Gaza? Like Gaza is closed off for Israelis, I think, for the last 10, 12, 15 years. Uh, before that, there were settlements. Uh, have you ever been to Gaza? Because, like, young people now, when we when we do, go to Israel and you meet like 20 year olds, and they're like, "Gaza, I've never been. I'm I'm not allowed." And of course, the other side can't can't get out either. I've been to Gaza. Yeah. What is, what does Zionism mean to you? Like you you used it already a lot. Like when we were there. 
in every interview, with every, everybody you talk to, everybody uses the term being a Zionist or the Zionist or the anti-Zionism, but everybody seems to have a, like a different definition what Zionism means. What does it mean to you? Do they? Uh, that surprises me. I would have thought that um, most people actually have a, a rather similar definition of Zionism, a definition that I'm, so to speak, trying to change. Um, but it's interesting that in your empirical experience, this is uh, different. In my understanding, most people today understand Zionism as believing in the right of the Jewish people to their own sovereign state in Eretz Israel, in the uh, territory of Palestine. That's the way I think often people think of Zionism. And if you deny that, then you're an anti-Zionist or an a-Zionist um, a or a post-Zionist. Um, That's not what Zionism is for me. I think that Zionism for me is a realization that the Jewish people has a right for um, national self-determination as opposed to sovereignty. So that um, there is such a thing as a Jewish people and the Jewish people like other people, like the Palestinian people, has a right um, uh, to uh, protect its own cultural heritage, its own language, its own tradition. Most certainly, um, the Jews also have um, very valid concerns to their security, given their history. And respecting those uh, concerns is also part of Zionism. However, um, my Zionism is one in which one insists that we can and ought uh, preserve those commitments, not in the form of a Jewish state, but in a form of uh, a national republic. Um, and in fact, that the best way to ensure Zionism, that is, those interests um, of Jews for their national self-determination, are exactly not in a sovereign Jewish state. Um, it's important because this is not just my personal view. What I try to show in the book is that this is a view of the founding fathers of Zionism. And uh, to that extent, you know, a philosopher can come and invent all sorts of nice notions. Um, history becomes important to philosophers when they can show you that their views are not just inventions. They are um, the motivations that I try to um, promote in this book are the motivations historically of Zionism. Uh, the ideas that I'm trying to promote here are ideas that were the ideas and the motivations of original Zionism. That's why I think I'm in a relatively powerful position when people come to me and say, well, this is anti-Zionism, right? Because Zionism is a belief in a sovereign Jewish state, not in a binational republic. So you actually want to abolish the Jewish state and you're um, anti-Zionist, not to say anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. So, pass off. Actually, I'm much more consistent with Herzl, the early Ben-Gurion and Jabotinsky the right-wing Zionist, who to the end of his life said, this is a quote, the future of Zionism must be, sorry, the future of Palestine must be, legally speaking, of a bi-national state. This is Jabotinsky, the uh, role model of people like um, um, Begin, Menachem Begin, um, should have been the role model of Benjamin Netanyahu, officially is the role model of Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, so the position I'm supporting is um, by all means Zionist, but not Zionism as we've come to know it. I remember like Gideon Levy, like he explained it, like there are people who are Zionist who say, okay, since Israel became a state, like its own state, Zionism has been, let's call it, fulfilled. The dream has been so fulfilled. And then there are uh, like the settlers who use Zionism or call themselves Zionists so to justify their actions, as in uh, this Palestinian territory that you call occupied is actually f uh, um, ancient Israel. So, and since we are Zionist and Israel, uh, this is part of Israel as well, We, because we say so, and our uh, book says so, um, 
that's that's how we are justified to to do what we do. Yeah, on this view, so on this view, um, the position would be that Zionism was the strive of the Jewish people to establish a state, and once a state was established, Zionism, so to speak, it's a little bit like Wittgenstein's ladder. You climb it and then you kick it. And um, 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 another very, very good uh, person and very powerful and interesting uh, who has this view of Zionism is Avrum Burg. Avrum Burg uh, used to be the president of Israel's Knesset, uh, of the parliament. And at some point he came, so to speak, out of the closet and he said, uh, you know, I'm not really a Zionist. I don't support uh, the idea of a Jewish state, but rather of a, a federation. Um, and he also has a similar line there. He would say, look, um, Zionism was an ideology that led to the establishment of a state. Once the state is established, we don't really um, need Zionism. Yeah. Um, on this view, you, then the settlers, just as he pointed out, would actually, on, in a way, they, they participate in the same type of argument. They say, well, maybe, but the project is not done yet. Exactly. We uh, still need to uh, take over the rest of uh, the territory. And this is why Zionism is still alive. I think both positions are false. I think that um, um, Zionism is um, the realization, I'm just repeating myself, Zionism is a realization that the Jews have a right to national self-determination. As long as you're committed to this notion, you are a Zionist. Um, which does not mean, by the way, and this is extremely important, because Zionism is an ideology. Some people try to deny this, but this is obvious, especially to anyone who grew up in Israel. Zionism is an ideology, and it is an official state ideology in Israel. No other way to put it. Um, by no means do I think that kids should be indoctrinated to uh, um, this type of ideology. But it is a certain uh, set of values that um, I think does not go away when um, a state is established. Um, capitalism does not cease to be an ideology when uh, a capitalist state is established. Zionism does not go away when a Jewish state is established. And Zionism, in my view, should not go away when a bi-national federation, the Haifa Republic, will be um, um, established, people will still be able to be Zionist. They will be able to believe in the right of the Jewish people to self-determination. What I also learned uh, on the Palestinian side, why they call themselves anti-Zionist, is because of the occupation, because the uh, Israeli occupation j justifies the occupation with Zionism. So what they seem to say is like, we are anti-Zionist because we are against the occupation. I think that uh, to that extent that they are right, and I, um, well, I'll put it in this way. I understand them, and they are right. If Zionism is an ideology that's supposed to disown the Palestinians from their rights and from their land, then, of course, they're anti-Zionist. Can you be non-Zionist or anti- Wait a second, I just, okay, okay. because I think this actually it goes much deeper. The Palestinians should not just say that because of the occupation. The Palestinians should say this also because of the Nakba. Zionism is um, uh, a movement that, in order to establish a Jewish state, um, had to um, also expel the Palestinians from their land. This is, of course, complicated. The story is not simple. It is true that Israel was also defending itself. It is true that we're speaking here about 47, 48, 49, also very soon after the Holocaust, and the Jews had any reason, every reason to uh, be convinced that they are fighting for their lives. The story is not easy, but by all means, the Palestinians have a, um, um, not just a right, they, they are correct that to the extent that Zionism is a movement that um, consists in uh, expelling them from their land in order to create a Jewish majority and then to sustain the occupation, they need to be anti-Zionist. Now, You can go then and become a Zionist, perhaps, if you want peace. My view is, if you're an a Zionist, then you do not recognize the right of the Jews to um, self, nas national self-determination. So we have here what Kantians call an antinomy. 
right? You have a contradiction between two claims that seem to be justified. On the one hand, you have the Palestinians. And the Palestinians say, well, look, we are against this movement. We're against Jewish, the Jewish state. We're against Zionism because Zionism consists in um, expelling us from our land and the occupation. On the other hand, you have the Jews, and the Jews say, we are Zionists because we have the right to national self-determination. All the more, given the Holocaust, we have a real concern to our safety. Both are right. I try to show that this is not a real contradiction, but what Kant would call an antinomy. And the reason is that um, both positions can actually be maintained if we just notice that Zionism does not consist in the idea of a um, sovereign Jewish state. It consists in national self-determination. The contradiction is resolved by the fact that since it consists in national self-determination and not in sovereignty, you do not need to expel the Palestinians in order to create a Jewish majority. And you do not need to have um, a Jewish state ruling over Palestinians um, without giving them citizenship, since a Jewish state cannot um, agree to accept um, the citizenship of too many Palestinians, right? So there was a contradiction there, and some people want to resolve it, right? The contradiction is between um, being anti-Zionist because Zionists want to expel Palestinians. I don't know if they want to. They, not all of them want to, but some of them realize that they need to. Important distinction. On the other hand, you have the, uh, the Zionists who say, well, we are Zionists, even if we will have to expel the Palestinians and um, 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 sustain the occupation. One tendency is to resolve this contradiction by um, denying one of the legs of the contradiction. So one of them would be, well, then I'm not a Zionist. Another is, I'm not a liberal. I don't accept the rights of Palestinians. I try to show you do not resolve the contradiction by giving up on one of the positions. You resolve the contradiction by giving up on the assumption on wh of what Zionism is. Zionism need not be um, um, the idea of a Jewish state. And for that reason, you can have a Zionist politics that's fully consistent with uh, the rights of Palestinians. And I will say also this. I think that the wise Palestinians that I've met sort of understand this. And I will tell you why. They understand this because they too want to preserve their national rights as Palestinians. You can have a cosmopolitan position and say, look, we're all human beings, we're all citizens, we live in a, a post-national uh, uh, reality, just forget about it. Okay, that will be truly utopian. Right? Some people have complained against my book that it's utopian, that mm. um, the Haifa Republic is uh, okay. um, um, unrealistic. The idea is that we, you can establish in this region just a post-national uh, society where Jews don't care about the fact that they're Jews, Palestinians just don't care about the fact that they're Palestinians, that seems to me um, irrelevant politically. The Palestinians have a very legitimate aspiration to have national self-determination. They are Palestinians. They need to recognize that the Jews do have this right and this concern. And both people can recognize this mutually. Jews can recognize the right of the Palestinians to Palestinian self-determination. And the Palestinians can recognize um, the right of the Jews to national self-determination. This is why I think that um, wise Palestinians would not go anti-Zionist in that sense. They will go against the idea of a Jewish state, of course because uh, they cannot be a part of a Jewish state, and they live in the region. What about Germans? Do Germans need to be Zionists? <laughs> um, I mean, we, we always obviously support the right of uh, notice, Jewish people. Not is that I, when I spoke about, I spoke about uh, wise Palestinians, and um, uh, by which I meant, I don't want to say what the Palestinians have to be. I'm not sitting here... Um, um, I mean, I do have a PhD in philosophy, but this does not give me the ability to uh, say um, the Palestinians have to, the Germans have to, or the Israelis have to. Um, I can say what I think they should. Um, 
I do think that Germans should be Zionist. And I think so, though, um, they should be Zionist in the way that I understand Zionism. And the reason is exactly this um, antinomy that I just described. I think that Germans have a good reason to be committed to um, the concerns of the Jewish people, to uh, their safety, security, uh, to national self-determination in the sense of um, um, preserving Jewish culture, education, history, and so forth. However, the Germans, I hope so, should also have um, a genuine concern to uh, preserving universalism, um, international law, democracy, liberalism. So if Zionism cannot be liberal and democratic and cannot preserve international law, the Germans are in a problem. And my suspicion is that Germans have been tempted to uh, then just support Zionism. And when it comes to the state of Israel, make an exception. I think that's an awful way to learn uh, from German past, because Germans need to be fully committed to international law, human rights, and so forth, as human beings and as Germans. So the question is, how can you make both commitments um, coherent, consistent with one another? And as I said, I think that there is a way to do that. You can adopt a form of Zionism that is liberal and democratic and universalist, because it does not consist in Jewish sovereignty, which necessarily excludes the right of Palestinians to a state, citizenship, and so forth, but um, precisely recognizes this right of Palestinians and of Jews. Um, in my view, equally. Germany, sorry, like, equally. Like, should Germans support uh, like a Jewish self-determination as much and equally as Palestinian self-determination? I understand. Look, we live in the world. I think that ideally, people should speak not as Germans. They should speak as persons, as people, as individuals, as human beings. You know what I mean? Exactly. We have baggage. Um, exactly. And I think the baggage is meaningful. And the baggage cannot just be given up and should not be just given up. So I understand. And again, I think that wise Palestinians should understand that too. I understand that Germans have a certain relation to the state of Israel, uh, to the interest of Jewish self-determination. It should not be, you know, Merkel famously said that uh, the, um, the state of Israel is, uh, what is it, a uh, raison d'etat of uh, Germany. Maybe. I'll tell you what it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a blank check. That you just, you know, whatever Israel does, we will support it. And um, Germany hasn't behaved in this way. It hasn't been just a blank check. But it's gone very, very, very far supporting um, Israel's massive um, violations of international law. And, um, you know, I'm also a German citizen. So let me now speak as a German citizen. Um, I think that uh, we Germans should not violate international law. And as Germans, um, precisely because of that history, better not go against international law in the interest of the international community, in the interest of Germany, and pass south, also in the interest of Jews. Because um, where people play fast and loose with international law, with liberalism, very quickly, you end up undermining also the interests of minorities, and by all means, also of the Jewish minorities. Often when it seems that um, 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 some, some type of populist, nationalist, um, racist, friends of Israel, from Donald Trump to uh, Orban, Those people now are friends of Israel, and uh, some uh, uh, people in the Jewish community therefore um, just love it and sort of support these people. And if they don't support it, don't support them, they prefer to keep silent about those nationalists because those nationalists support Israel. It always ends up backfiring against minorities and the Jews. Jewish people should choose whether they think 
the best way to defend their rights and their lives is to insist on democracy and liberalism or to insist on Zionism. Germans, I think, need to choose between a very, actually very similar uh, dilemma, so to speak, and they should choose being committed to Jews, being committed to their history, by um, being genuinely committed to universalism, democracy, and liberalism. This is not simple, it's not easy, um, it's not um, always comfortable, because I understand that it's uncomfortable for some Germans to criticize Israel, for good reasons. Who said it needs to be comfortable to be German? Who said it needs to be, uh, you, it's supposed to be comfortable to, um, to have a German baggage? Mm -hmm. Not supposed to be. Like, since you mentioned Orban, Trump, uh, we could go, the list could go on with right-wing radicals in, uh, in power in those nations. Um, Moshe Zimmermann, Professor uh, Zimmermann, like he explained why like Bibi Netanyahu and his, his Likud party is actually a rechtsradikale partei as, as well, right-wing radicals. As a German, wh why do you think like like the German press, German media, Germans, like when they consider Trump and Orban and other, like uh, Salvini in Italy, like we, all, we publicly and openly talk about that they are right-wing radicals. Like that's, uh, un, we are uncomfortable as Germans with that. We are, we are uncomfortable with AFD. But how come like we treat Netanyahu and this party and his policies different? I think we need to be very clear about this. I can tell you a story. Um, A few months ago, when uh, Corona just started, I gave an interview to uh, um, a German radio station. And uh, they asked me about Netanyahu, and they asked me about whether I think that there is a, a danger to Israeli democracy in uh, this moment of Auf, um, Ausnahmezustand, because of Corona. Um, um, if there is a danger to Israeli democracy because of the Ausnahmezustand, when Bibi is in power. And I said, just imagine that the AfD was in government in Germany and just announced officially an Ausnahmezustand and said that the, uh, um, um, the parliament um, can no longer practice its, uh, um, um, can no longer oversee the actions of the government. Would you think that there is a, um, um, a danger to German democracy? My interviewer, um, um, a very respectable uh, German journalist, um, I think was a little bit shocked. The follow-up question was immediately, is it not a little bit extreme to compare Bibi Netanyahu and Netanyahu's government to an AfD government? And I think we really need to be um, very clear about this. Absolutely not too extreme, right? Um, the Maßstäbe, yeah, the, um, the standards of what counts as extreme right, dangerous extreme right, should be clear and they should be the same all around the world, it seems to me, yeah. if we're looking at uh, dangers to democracy. When I was talking to this journalist, Netanyahu had in his cabinet a minister who supported on paper, not apartheid, but the violent expulsions of Palestinians um, from Gaza and the West Bank. He had the Minister of Education who said, to the record, I've killed many Arabs in my life and there is nothing wrong with that. Benjamin Netanyahu himself, on paper, well, not just legislated, the law of the nation state, which says this is a country of Jews, not of citizens, uh, but said it just like that. This is a country of Jews, not of um, citizens as such. I'm not an expert of the German AfD, but I think they're actually, they stand to the right of the AfD. They're at least as dangerous to democracy as um, the AfD. That needs to be uh, stated very clearly. Of course, Jews 
um, are so far being uh, treated relatively okay by this government, but non-Jews um, um, are facing a government that's at least as hostile as an IFD government would be to refugees, to Muslims, and so forth. Um, those people should be called up, out. You know, um, when Netanyahu when Netanyahu was trying to get re-elected in the last round of elections, he did everything in his power to get Itamar Ben-Gvir, uh, the head of a party that's called Jewish Power, into parliament. This is a party that was outlawed by the Israeli Supreme Court because of its explicit racism. Uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir, he has in his house a picture of uh, um, um, Baruch Goldstein, the Israeli terrorist who uh, uh, killed uh, 30 uh, Muslims praying in Hebron. We went to his monument in Hebron. So uh, they have a big picture of him. You know, he says, you know, uh, um, Goldstein is more sacred than all the victims of the Holocaust, something like that. This is how just uh, he, disgusting he, it is. He massacred, massacred Palestinians in, in a mosque, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, um, in fact, it is a party that explicitly enough supported the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin because of the Oslo process. Benjamin Netanyahu did everything he can explicitly. This is not now me inventing or me analyzing the procedures. This is completely in the open, making promises uh, to this party, that if it will only run with another party, you know, if they will only have the right deal, he will give them everything they want, so that um, they will actually enter parliament. He did everything he could to get this party, really a neo-Nazi Jewish party, to get them into parliament. What would you call such a politician uh, in Germany? Anybody who cares about democracy, liberalism, needs to speak clearly about this. Netanyahu is not a conservative. Perhaps somewhere deep in his heart, he is a conservative. Uh, for a long time now, he hasn't been acting as a conservative. He's changing the, um, um, well, Israel doesn't have a constitution, but it has basic laws. He's changing them radically. Um, he's promoting hate speech. He's promoting, really, not just uh, extreme right parties, but openly fascist parties, um, um, really promoting them. He should be called what he is, and that is not a conservative. But the question was, how come, like, in German media, European media, uh, the societies, we don't consider him and the Israeli government as right-wing ra radicals, right-wing extremists, like compared to the autocrats in Hungary, America, Italy, Poland, Russia? Do you speak for the media with a we? Um, no, but um, like uh, these are like, I mean, I've been following. Uh, yeah, I've been following it too. Coverage. Every time that I see the New York Times referring to the conservative prime minister, Bibi Netanyahu. Yeah, same, same, same with Hagerschau and Heute Journal. Same with the New York when, Times. When, same with the New York Times. I, each time I want to write a letter to the editor and be one of those annoying people who just nag you and say, he is not a conservative. It, it sounds like he's like Merkel. Merkel is a conservative. Awful. It's awful. We have, to, uh, we have to, uh, to be clear about the truth. One thought, there was a moment when Trump got elected that um, people will insist on the truth, that uh, journalists will realize that they have a real uh, obligation to report the truth. And to some extent, to some extent, um, they also act this way. Not enough. Benjamin Netanyahu and his government is not um, a conservative government. Look, it's an awful truth, but it's not even just Benjamin Netanyahu. Think about Benny Gantz. Up until recently, the uh, center and left opposition. People will think that I'm radical, but I'm not. Benny Gantz is probably near to the positions of the IFD. Netanyahu stands to the right of them. Again, maybe rhetorically I'm making a mistake now because then people will look and say, okay, relax, um, you're being a radical. 
Well, look at the content of what he says. Look at the politics that he promotes. Benny Gantz would prefer going with Netanyahu, by all means a far-right politician, than uh, to have a coalition with Arab parliament members for just one reason, that they are Arabs. They support democracy. Um, Benny Gantz um, ran on a ticket of being the military chef who uh, uh, um, killed um, 1,400 uh, Palestinians in Gaza in the uh, 2014 Gaza campaign. I saw the ad, TV ad. Um, He obviously uh, supported Trump's deal of the century and the annexations. Some Germans were um, surprised about that. I wasn't. Um, I never thought that uh, Gantz is a liberal or a two-state supporter or anything like that. Um, think about Yair Lapid, the good-looking um, the former Tel finance Avivian, minister. The former finance minister. That's right. Um, that's he was a, a TV person. Exactly. That's yeah. the charitable way of putting it. I would have said the former uh, <laughs> uh, uh, model and cheap talk show host. Uh-huh. Um, uh huh. But that's right. He was a min- the finance minister as well. He's uh, uh, a Tel Avivian secular. Seems to be um, liberal. Yeah. Look at the way he speaks. This would remind people in Germany of the AfD, Benjamin Netanyahu will remind people of politics much to the right of the AfD. You said it, I mean, I think comparison, we need to be also careful with comparison, but, but it is so extreme, but it is so extreme that we need to be clear. Um, but, why, what, but, but the question was, why is it so hard to be clear like in Europe, in the US? It's difficult to be clear because of the past. And uh, it's necessary to be clear because of the past. And um, again, um, um, that's the task of the book, to say, look, people will go on and accuse you and me of being anti-Semitic if we say this truth clearly. Actually, this truth is being stated in honor of the past, having learned from the past. You need to point at Netanyahu and say how dangerous to democracy he is. You need to look at Yair Lapid, the hope of some people in the center here maybe, and say, this cannot be your hope. This is someone who boycotts the newspaper Haaretz, the only liberal newspaper in Israel. He says that you have to boycott it and cancel um, subscriptions because Haaretz is too critical. This is not the liberal alternative in Israel. Um, this needs to be said clearly if we care, if we've learned something from the past, we need to know that uh, democracy can crumble and that it crumbles where we do not describe reality adequately. But couldn't you like say, I mean a, a large majority of the Israelis when they go vote, support uh, in one way or the other, right-wing radicals or extremists by their vote. Maybe the Israeli society is a right-wing radical society. Look, here this is where I, I'm, uh, I want to become because, careful. Because you, you, you just mentioned there's only one liberal newspaper. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any liberal parties of meaning. Many things to, um, are, are important to be said about your question. Because I think this is actually where, on the one hand, we need to speak very clearly. On the other hand, we need to be careful. Um, I think that's right. And um, um, Israeli society is, extre- is voting for the extreme right. Look, here's one way to put it. People now oppose Bibi Netanyahu, but the truth is, if Bibi Netanyahu were not the head of the Likud party, I would say that any party to the right of merits, tiny little leftist party, would be able to sit in coalition together with the Likud. Right? So you actually have this striking fact. Israel didn't manage to have a government coalition um, in three elections. Actually, there is full consensus on politics, almost full consensus. Everything that is to the right of the Arab-Israeli party the joint list, and merits a tiny fraction of the Israeli left. We're talking about four seats, 
three seats in uh, Israel's parliament out of 120, everything to the right of that would agree about Trump's deal of the century and about this national, not to say nationalist, politics. That's a disaster. It needs to be said clearly, and we need to speak seriously about why this happened and how to change it. However, we also need to be, I think, and this is, is important, um, I think, for German audience, but not just to German audience. There has to be solidarity, I think, with Israel, as I insist, and that's a very fine line to be walk, walking. There is a difference between um, Zionist Jews who, um, because of their Zionism, veer to the right, veer to nationalism and so forth, and IFD supporters. Not every center Gantz voter is your equivalent of an IFD supporter, and the difference is precisely in the history. To be a German IFD supporter is exactly not like being a Jew who is committed to Zionism and um, uh, Jewish national interest and so forth. It's exactly the opposite. Now, the fact that it's the opposite does not justify it. The fact that it's the opposite does not say that this is a good course to be taking politically. The fact that it's opposite shows that, that we can, and I think ought, to be in solidarity in Israel. And precisely because of this solidarity, strive to overcome this nationalism. Um, so when the, um, um, you ask me this question, is Israeli society not just nationalist? So, well, yes and no, hold your horses. Let's be careful with our rhetoric. Israeli society is going very far to the right. It, it stated with pain, and it stated not with hate. You know, if Germans go to the right, I don't want to speak nice to the camera, but they can go, you know, mm -hmm. they can go to hell. When Jews do this in Israel, I think we need to understand why. And in solidarity, hope to promote the alternative. For me, it's not in solidarity. I'm Jewish and Israeli. This is my country as a patriot. Maybe you in solidarity as a German. Um, um, and that's an important distinction. That's exactly where at least me, my ears become sensitive when a German journalist, um, who as far as I can see, whose work I admire, because he's clear, namely you, asks, so is not Israeli society extreme right nationalist? Yes, but careful, uh, because that's a moment when exactly instead of veering to delegitimis, uh, delegitimizing a certain society, we need to um, to see how to approach it politically um, with a lot of understanding. I would have added the contradiction that I experienced myself or as we um, experienced it while being there a few times. The people there that you meet, that you uh, talk to, that you party with, they seem to be as liberal and European and Western as, as, as you can imagine. I mean, in Tel Aviv is like uh, gay pride and um, anything that you know from, from Berlin. Like Tel Aviv reminded me a lot of Berlin at, at some point. I think not. And I think this is, I, I write about this a little bit in the book when I call my solution the Haifa Republic. Say not the Tel Aviv Republic. And there is a good reason to that. Tel Aviv is a wonderful city. I love it too. It has a great beach, it has great restaurants. Uh, people say beautiful women and men. I see all that. Sure. Um, however, Tel Aviv is a model of life in Israel, it is a model of what life could be like if only secular, let's call it white Jews, could live among themselves. It's an illusion to say, oh, Tel Aviv looks a, little, a lot like Berlin. Well, maybe. I didn't find the spot in Tel Aviv that looks like Kreuzberg, for example. Tel Aviv is a Jewish city. And uh, um, it's a vacuum in that sense. And 
liberal cities are not in a vacuum. New York is um, multinational. Berlin also is, to a certain extent, could be more, could be less, there are problems, definitely more than Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is a Jewish city. I don't know your history personally, but uh, you could not live in Tel Aviv in the long term because you're not Jewish. You will not get your citizenship. It's as easy as that. Um, this is why I suggest the um, Haifa Republic as a much more complex model of what it means to live not just Jews among themselves, but rather a mixed city, not as hype as Tel Aviv, perhaps. Could be more hype than Tel Aviv if this great multicultural potential will actually be adopted. Because Tel Aviv, as wonderful as it is, really, it is wonderful, um, suffers from not being a genuinely multicultural city. And it will not be able to be, um, as Tel Aviv, a multicultural city. Because it's a Jewish city. Because it's the Hebrew Jewish city, a beautiful project. By the way, Tel Aviv, I don't know how many people know this. Herzl uh, wrote a book, The Visionary of Zionism. It was called Alt Neuland. Alt Yeah. Um, uh, uh, old New Land. It was translated, this is the most important book. Well, yeah, well, the most important book, a utopian book, announcing Zionism. Um, do you know how the term Alt Neuland was translated into Hebrew? Tel Aviv. Really? Yeah. And that's the origin of the name. Um, well, again, it's a Hebrew city. It was thought of as a utopian city in that sense. We need to move on from that model. Um, the model cannot be just the model of Jews living among themselves. What about Haifa? Like, I'm sure many who listen to us have never been to Haifa. They've heard of Tel Aviv or even visited Tel Aviv or maybe Jerusalem. What about Haifa? Haifa is a, um, um, it's a good question. It's an important one because um, I need to, you know, I, I speak about the Haifa Republic and um, I, Uh, there is one form of criticism that hasn't been raised against me, and I expected would be raised against me, um, and would have been good criticism. It would also have a good answer. Uh, but it wasn't raised, so I didn't have the opportunity to answer. And it is this. Haifa is not a utopia. Um, life in Haifa is extremely complex. It is uh, um, a city that is genuinely mixed. Arabs and Jews live more or less um, in the same city, not apart. And um, it more or less functions. Hospitals, you see this when you go to the hospital. You know, Jews don't meet Arabs before they go to the military in Israel, famously, because there is real segregation. We don't go to the same schools, we don't, you know, we don't live in the same cities mostly. When you go to the hospital in Haifa, suddenly, you lie side by side with Arab patients. The doctors are also Arabs, and many of them, and some of the best in the country. Some of the cafes in Haifa, some of the nicest cafes in Haifa, are Arab cafes. Um, you know, if you go in Haifa to the cafe that would pretend to be like Tel Aviv or like Berlin, you'll immediately be disappointed. It's, not going, to, it's going to be provincial. The places in Haifa that are not provincial like that are the great cafes that actually belong to Arabs, but they're fully modern. I would, in my imagination, I've never been and I probably could not go, in my imagination a little bit probably like Beirut. You go to Haifa and you can sit in a cafe that's an Arab modern cafe in, um, in a city in Israel. The menu is in Arabic. The food is somewhere you know between arabic arab food and so forth but it's not the um the israeli hip version on oriental cuisine it's arab food in haifa and not in an oriental arab restaurants but rather just you know um uh, of young people that's um um now 
Haifa has great problems. There are problems of racism in Haifa, there's problem of poverty, there's um, um, sometimes violence between Arabs and Jews. So someone who knows internal Israeli reality should have jumped and said, um, Haifa Republic, not even in Haifa you see that. In Haifa you get a glimpse of that possibility. Um, I think that is a glimpse that we have to hold on to and, um, and promote as the model, the regulative model, the regulative ideal that we need to um, strive to um, when we go to the future. Kind of reminds me of Yehuda Shaul saying like Hebron is the perfect example for Israeli occupation in the West Bank. And you say Haifa is like perfect model of your idea of a binational state, a one state. I think that's right. And I think it's right for another reason. It's right because of the history. Haifa, most Jews uh, in Israel do not remember this. Haifa is the symbol of the Palestinian disaster in the Nakba. Because it is the city, you know, Israeli Jews usually hear about um, Dir Yassin, the big massacre that happened in Dir Yassin, a small village uh, where um, a horrifying massacre happened. Um, actually, Haifa is the big Palestinian trauma and the place that symbolizes to Palestinians the moment of the collapse of Palestinian society in the war. Because in more or less than 48 hours, Almost, almost 100% of the city's Palestinian population just fled the city. Um, um, I don't want to give here uh, false numbers, but they are around the, you know, from a population of 70,000 back then, a robust population. Uh, over 48 hours, only 3,000 remain. Uh, Golda Meir, Israel's uh, prime minister, later on, went to Haifa just after um, um, uh, the expulsion and the massive escape from the city. She went to Haifa and this is described in the book. She left no doubt. She said, this is probably how Jewish shtetls uh, seemed like when Jews were escaping. Because you could still, she still saw, she was shocked because she still saw the, the coffee on the table and the pita bread on the table of people who escaped. She understood that people really had to escape. This is important to the notion of the Haifa Republic. This is important precisely because we have to be historical in our understanding of the future. When we, uh, um, it is a beautiful fact about Haifa, I think, that despite this history, it still is today a mixed Arab Jewish city. And there are practices of cohabitation in that city. Um, that's one fact of history. Another fact of history is that through the port of Haifa, many of the Jewish refugees who escaped uh, Europe managed to get smuggled into the country through Haifa. So Haifa often overlooked, you know, is, everybody knows about Jerusalem. Uh, it's uh, um, um, the city of uh, Jewish and not just Jewish longing. Um, everybody knows about Tel Aviv, it's uh, a city of uh, great uh, gay parties. People know less about Haifa. Um, Haifa is a model, not taken naively, not ignoring the obvious problems with reality in Haifa today, um, can be an interesting, the interesting political model for the future. So you've, you've mentioned the Nakba a few times already. Um, I remember, like, after the first time being in Israel and Palestine, like, we came back and, like, we were shocked that apparently we were never taught about uh, Nakba in Germany. Like, I never heard about it at school. You can't, obviously and rightfully so, escape the Holocaust and what G Germans did. But the Palestinians, the Palestinian side of their history of catastrophes I've never heard before. So um, what I want to know, when you went to school in Israel, did your teachers, did you learn about Nakba? Of course not. Of course And not. Of course not. And um, obviously not. And they still do not learn in school about it. Really? 
Absolutely not. Um, people learn sometimes that um, Palestinians escaped. They were stupid cowards who, uh, by magic, just decided to escape of the way in which politically and systematically they were driven out. Nobody speaks in Israeli textbooks. It's uh, um, an obvious black spot. Israel has a law. It's called the Nakba law. It, um, um, under some circumstances, um, you can uh, be penalized for commemorating the Nakba under some circumstances. Um, so uh, Jews in Israel waver between celebrating the expulsion and pretending that it didn't happen. Depending a little bit, there's real false consciousness there. Um, sometimes there is a tendency to say, yes, well, we had to do it and we did it. Mm. Ari Shavit, he was less famous in uh, this country. He was uh, one of the top best sellers for weeks and weeks in the US for writing this book, uh, My Promised Land, with this main thesis. Yes, yes, we have to speak about the Nakba. We did, you know, so, as I show in the book, for years, our best minds, our best intellectuals did not speak about the Nakba. Forget the Ministry of Education. Forget the fact, forget the fact that um, you do not learn about it in school. What about Amos Oz? What about David Grossman? Uh, those people. They always made the occupation the original sin of Israel this accident that just happened to us and has to be corrected in order to return to the good old, good old Zionism. Pre yeah. Now, speaking about the Nakba doesn't fit this clean, nice narrative. So you don't find them writing about this. Um, Ari Shavit comes along, 2012, and says, no, no, we have to speak about the Nakba and affirm it. It did happen. And you know, um, it had to happen. You either take, this is the argument of, the, of his book, you either take um, Zionism and understand that the Nakba is necessary and accept Zionism with the Nakba, or you give up on Zionism because it had to do the Nakba. And says Ari Shavit, and so many liberal Zionists, we accept Zionism with the Nakba. Not even once was the reasonable, rational, progressive, modern relation to this attempted. Namely to say, we are Zionists and the Nakba happened and it ought not to have happened. And when we see, when we learn about this history, we do not either accept Zionism with the Nakba or um, reject Zionism because of the Nakba. We understand that Zionism must change. Yeah. Um, we have to understand why a certain concept of Zionism produced the Nakba. We must say so very clearly. We must teach this history, teach it to our kids, and understand that Zionism has to change such that it will not necessarily um, promote this type of politics that makes the Nakba possible. What does the Nakba mean to... Arab Israelis to Palestinians? First, I'm not the person to answer this. I'm not, this is now not an assertion of identity politics as in I do not have the right. I, know. Um, I do not have the right. Um, 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 I can speak about how I understand this, but uh, it is a question for uh, um, a Palestinian. I think the Nakba um, symbolizes to Palestinians um, shame. Think that a lot of Palestinians feel shame about it. And this is because uh, it's a sign of their defeat. It's a great defeat. It's a moment in which they lost uh, their nationhood and their land. Um, so um, one thing is this great defeat. It also um, created um, a very difficult political uh, separation between the Palestinians who live inside Israel and those who live outside Israel. So um, part of the embarrassment, part of the defeat, 
is in creating this split now between um, Arab Israelis and Palestinians who no longer are, are they the same people? I mean, they are, by all means, I would say. But um, they have very different lives for a very long time now. And um, I think that, um, you know, there can be psychological, sociological, uh, anthropological meanings to the Nakba. Speaking as a philosopher, or as a political philosopher in this case, Let's speak about the political meaning of the Nakba. I think that the political meaning of the Nakba, um, if you're interested in the future, is the fact that a, um, a separation between Arab Israelis and Palestinians who are not living in Israel was created. And this separation has everything to do with the way we think about the future. Because um, in In a binational reality, those Palestinians will again be part of the same unity. Um, and how they will go about this, how this can be created, what will be the meaning of that, is a very interesting fact. Um, also, here is an example. This is something we haven't spoken about, and perhaps we don't need to speak about. Um, in my imagination, the only hope we have for a solution, politically, goes through the power of the joint list in Israel. That is, um, a party of Arab-Israeli representatives. We, like we have Ahmad, T T Ahmad TV Tibi, wonderful. On, I saw that you, re that yeah. you, uh, um, that you uh, interviewed him. He's very important in my book. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's a wonderful representative. Great interview, by the way. Watch it. He's, he is terrific. And uh, he gave a, an important Holocaust memorial speech that in my chapter on the Holocaust and on the relation to uh, our past, I end with um, analyzing Ahmad Tibi's Holocaust memorial speech in Israel's Knesset because um, he tries to go exactly down that path of saying, look, we live together. I, as a Palestinian, I am in eternal solidarity with the Jewish people. Um, I understand the Holocaust. We have to commemorate it. Um, that's an important step in the creation of the Haifa Republic. Um, but, um, yes, the joint list is a, is a party of Arab-Israeli representatives. And we have to draw on their power in order to promote um, an opposition where the country is now going, because there is nothing left of the old liberal Zionist parties in Israel. But here is an interesting question. Can the joint list also be, at first symbolically, perceived as the leadership or a leadership of the Palestinians in the occupied territories? Abbas is no good. Hamas is no good. What's the alternative? It would be an extremely interesting development if the joint list, by the way, joint also as in joint to Arabs and Jews in Israel, will, it cannot just become the representative of the Palestinians, but a representative also function as, um, also function in this capacity. Um, it's not easy because of this separation that I just mentioned between Arab-Israeli society within Israel and Palestinian society outside of Israel, right? Um, if they can assume this role, then I think um, it's going to be a very interesting development um, on the way to an alternative solution in Israel, uh, alternative to the two-state solution. Because on a two-state solution, you get, a, say, PLO, ideally, uh, um, um, asserting Palestinian sovereignty, and you get Israel, and Arab Israelis can be also representatives within Israel in the Jewish state. In a binational uh, reality, you somehow need to have representatives who represent everybody. The joint list can actually fun begin to function in this way. It would be a very interesting move. Before we talk about uh, the binational 
uh, idea of yours, uh, let's talk about democracy itself. Is the current Israeli system, is it a democracy? Like we know in Germany, for example. Yes and no. Um, you know, um, it's a good question, but it's also not a good question, because um, is America a, demo a democracy? Is Germany a democracy? Is Israel a democracy? There are many ways in which Israel is not a democracy. Um, there are many ways in which Israel is a prosperous democracy. Israel has strong democratic institutions. They are under attack uh, um, for a long time now, and they are also decaying. So um, I'm not going to give you a yes or no answer. That's too easy. I'll give you the sense in which Israel is absolutely not a democracy. And I'll give you the sense in which Israel is absolutely a democracy. I think that's the reality. Israel is not a democracy to the extent that the truth is that Israel does not merely occupy the West Bank. The West Bank is already an integral part of Israel for a long time. And this can be validated. I can validate it in a few sentences. The settlers live in the West Bank. They vote to Israel's parliament from the West Bank. The laws that Israel's parliament legislates apply to those people in the West Bank. And now pass off. Israel has a little law it says that you cannot vote in absentia. So when I'm here in Germany, I cannot vote from afar. In order to vote to Israel's parliament, I have to be within the borders of the country. The settlers, 700,000 of them, 10% of Israel's Jewish population, live in the West Bank. Is it inside Israel or outside of Israel? It's inside Israel because those people vote in the West Bank, despite this law and because the Israeli law applies to them when they are in the West Bank. Now, since this is reality, and 3 million, 2.9 million Palestinians live on the same territory without being citizens, Israel cannot be called a democracy. To that extent, Israel is not a democracy. I remember, I remember Gideon Levy, I think, said, uh, it's only a democracy if you're Jewish. I want to contradict this in a second. We'll talk about it. Okay. I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The, here's another way in which Israel is not fu a full democracy also just within the 48 borders. It is because it is a Jewish state. And we need to say very clearly, a Jewish state cannot be truly a democracy. Why? The reason is the following. In a democracy, well, think about it like that. Abraham Lincoln once said, democracy is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. I think the statement is well known. So in democracy, the question is, who are the people? And the only answer that a democracy can give, all citizens. That's just the sense in which, in a democracy, the people, regardless of race, religion, and ethnicity, and gender, are sovereign. In the state of Israel, as a Jewish state, the people are not all citizens, but the Jews. No Zionist, as we know Zionism today, would deny that the state of Israel asserts Jewish sovereignty. That's precisely the point. To that extent, Arabs, non-Jews, do not belong in Israel to the sovereign Jewish people. It's so like 30% of it's people 20, in Israel. It depends how you count. Okay. If you count within the 48 borders, which I just denied that you should. But if you count within the 48 borders, it's um, about 23%. If you eliminate uh, the so-called Green Line, which Israel has eliminated and insists on eliminating, it's more like 47%. Um, so even those Arab Israeli citizens, they do not belong to the sovereign Jewish people. Think about it in Germany. Germany is an um, nation state, it's a state, it's a German state, it's a democracy. Um, the German people, so to speak, asserts its sovereignty. 
Um, however, I'm Jewish and I can be a part of the sovereign Jewish, uh, sovereign German people. Muslims can be part of the sovereign uh, German people. Who would deny that? Again, only the worst type of their supporters. This is why Germany can be a democratic nation state. In Israel, precisely this is not the case. Israel is not an Israeli state that asserts the sovereignty of citizens. It is a Jewish state. Muslims do not belong to the sovereign Jewish people. To that extent, um, there is a contradiction in the idea of a Jewish and democratic state. So those are the two ways in which Israel is not a democracy. That said, we also need to say that Israel in all sorts of ways has great democratic achievements. And they can't be denied and they should not be denied because we are not in the business of delegitimizing Israel. We are in the business of trying to think how to do better politics in this country. Um, Israel has, um, well, those institutions are um, unfortunately decaying right now because of fears of occupation, because of um, terrible corruption. But um, it is a country with still, you know, those things, are ch they change too fast, but still a powerful Supreme Court. Um, still, you know, I wish I could say this. A few years ago, I could say this, uh, full, you know, happily. It's no longer completely true, but Israel has some great basic laws uh, that, um, you know, one can take pride in. It has um, the... Um, the courts still defend basic uh, human rights. This is changing too fast now. It used to be the case. I mean, it, you, you had heads of government who were corrupt, who, were, who went to jail. Exactly. Like, so, we, like in German history so far, we had some corrupt, uh, probably some corrupt Bundeskanzlers and ministers. Nobody went to jail. I want to say this, and I, I don't want to be misunderstood, but it's even better than that. Better, yeah? Um, people sometimes say on the right, Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Arabs who live in Jordan, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Egypt do not live in a democracy like Arabs who live in Israel. To a certain extent, this is true. Um, you just mentioned the corruption cases. Think about our president, Moshe Katsav, former president. He went to prison for rape. He was convicted by an Arab-Israeli judge. Can you imagine um, a Palestinian judge sending the king of Jordan to prison for rape? Of course not. Now again, the example should not be misunderstood because often it is presented as an argument of the right to say, you know, and therefore, because this can happen, um, uh, Israel is a prosperous democracy. Well, this judge could not move to leave on the mountain where I grew up, in that little village, he could not live there because he's not Jewish. And that's legal in Israel. Um, the segregation. And that's by law. Um, so we should, not say, we should not give those examples too fast. We should recognize them. We should see the huge achievements of democracy in Israel. They exist by all means. We should celebrate them we should also see the way in which they're complex. That's the answer to the question whether Israel is democracy or not. It is not yes or no. I remember like Gideon Levy said on my program that like concerning the future and the occupation, of course, that Israelis n will need to decide between becoming um, a democracy like you envision or an apartheid state. Of course. Um, well, I mean, I just said apartheid, like if, if you, I mean, you're German as well, you know, a lot of people will scream now that, um, that um, you don't say. They need a reality check for two reasons. First, here's the situation on the ground. Since 50 years now, Jews live in the West Bank. If they live in the West Bank, they vote to Israel's parliament. The laws that this parliament legislates apply to them. This law is enforced on them by the Israel police. 
if they break it and get caught, they're trialed in an Israeli civilian court. The Palestinians who live side by side with them are, do not vote to parliament. Um, they're not subjected to this, to the laws that this parliament legislates, but to a military laws decided by generals. Um, this law is enforced on them, not by the Israel police, but by the military. And if they break it and get caught, they first face court martial. Do you call this a democracy? This is obviously apartheid. That's one thing. Second thing that needs to be said when Germans hotly debate whether this is apartheid or not, just to remind them, this is in the book, um, of a speech given by Menachem Begin in 1977, where he put it exactly in those terms. He said, we need to offer all Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Israeli citizenship. We do this, we ought to do this, because otherwise we will be like Rhodesia. For those who forget, the young watchers of uh, Jung and Naive, Rhodesia was a symbol of South African apartheid. Otherwise we will be like apartheid, begging from the podium of the Knesset, of Parliament. We have to offer them this in order not to become like Rhodesia and in order to be anti-racist. So Begin, uh, 40 years ago, said very clearly that if the Palestinians will not leave um, um, with equal conditions to Jews, then this will be apartheid. He said this 40 years ago. It was before there were hundreds of thousands of Jewish settlers living there with highways, research universities, uh, uh, banks, public schools, and so forth. And their own um, roads. Uh, I mean, the situation is clear. And again and again, this needs to be stated. Germans are worried about the term apartheid for an understandable reason. Let us say it clearly. Germans understand their history correctly as a history of Tete, yeah, of the uh, perpetrators against the Jews. They do not want to all too happily present the Jews as themselves perpetrators, and they do not want to make a delegitimation of Israeli politics. The answer needs to be, let us speak the truth, and let us speak the truth in order to describe reality adequately so that we can imagine better alternatives for Israel, not delegitimize the country. Um, um, calling Israel apartheid or calling those apart, you know, I said about democratic practices as opposed to anti-democratic practices. I will also not say that Israel is democratic or not, and I will not say that Israel is an apartheid state or not. There are clear apartheid practices in the West Bank. Um, what about Israel itself? In Israel itself, unfortunately, it spills also into Israel, and I can, I actually already described to you the ways in which it spills into Israel, and I can do this again in a moment. But, um, um, but again and again, let us insist that we say that in solidarity with Israel to promote better politics, to fight for the country, not against the country. If you really believe in um, this country, if you really care about this country, you better believe that stating the truth about it is necessary. The country doesn't need lies. It needs the truth so that it can become better. You will not make apartheid go by, by just um, killing the term, just as you're not going to make the occupation go uh, by killing the term. Um, that would be uh, my position. You mentioned another thing for a moment, and I interrupted you. You mentioned Ahmad, when we spoke about Ahmad Tibi, sorry, when you spoke about Gidon Levy, yeah. you, mentioned, um, um, you mentioned something that he said that actually goes back to Ahmad Tibi. You said, uh, Gidon Levy says it's a democracy for Jews. Ahmad Tibi has a nice uh, 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 play of words on the famous uh, Israel is a Jewish and democratic state. Um, he says, he likes to say, um, Israel is absolutely Jewish and democratic. It is democratic for Jews and Jewish for Arabs. 
as much as I like, love TB, I think we need to say that he's wrong. A Jewish state is also not democratic for Jews. That's also the answer to Gideon Levy. People forget this all too often. I don't know you. I don't know if you're a Christian. Would you think that Germany would be a democratic state if it would be a Christian state? I don't think so. Do you think that you have the right to live in a democratic state that's neutral about religion and race also if you happen to belong to the majority? I think that also Jews have the right. They, all, they just forget it. Also Jews have the right um, to live in a state that's democratic in the robust, simple sense of the term, that it's neutral about religion. People forget, but this is in their interests. Um, the idea of state neutrality is conceived also in order to protect the rights of individuals, Jews. Also, and this is now perhaps the most important and interesting and forgotten point here, also in order to protect the rights of those religious communities. Israel, because and not despite the fact that it's a Jewish state, is a country in the West that most harms the rights of the Jewish people. I'll say it again because it really cannot, I mean, people will think that I'm saying something weird. Israel, because and not despite the fact that it's a Jewish state, is a country that in the West harms the rights of Jews as Jews the most. Because um, as a Jewish state, it is not merely a Jewish state, but it also assumes a certain interpretation of what Judaism is. And if you do not subscribe to that interpretation of Judaism, then the state crushes this type of Judaism. Right? So um, originally, when the idea of state neutrality was conceived, liberalism, the idea was not just to protect the state from the authority of religion. The idea was also to protect religion and religious rights from the authority of the state. The state should not meddle with um, um, religious rights. So the state is neutral about it. Israel is not neutral about Judaism. And because it is not neutral about Judaism, if you do not conform to how the state understands Judaism, um, you're not free to practice your religion. Um, it's not a minor issue. Reform Judaism, Passauf, the largest religious Jewish community in the world, is not recognized in Israel. So if you are a reformed rabbi, you cannot convert people to Judaism. You cannot marry people in Israel. You cannot bury people in Israel. Obviously, you can do this in Germany. Obviously, you can do this in the US. Obviously, you can do this in Italy. Those states are neutral and they respect religious freedoms. Um, also of Jews. Israel does not respect the freedom of the largest religious community of Jews because it's a Jewish state. And it doesn't accept this form of Judaism. Was it outlawed or never made um, legal? It is, um, um, well, um, it functions this way. In Israel, you can, for example, get married. Let's think about marriage laws. In yeah. Israel, in order to get married, you famously, you only get married by the religious practices. There is no such a thing as civil marriage. Only if you're Jewish, only a rabbi can marry you. If you're Muslim, only um, uh, a Muslim authority can marry you and so forth. What, what, what about when I meet like a Jewish girl in Tel Aviv, I'm fa I fall in love, I want to marry her. Could I get married in Israel? No, because I'm not Jewish. But if you are a religious Jew, a member of the reformed Jewish community, and you want to get married with a reformed rabbi, Maybe some, someone would think that this is your right as a Jew. You also couldn't. You'll have to go to the ultra-Orthodox rabbi and get married there. This also means something about the uh, procedure that the Jewish girl you mentioned 
uh, will have to go through. She will have to go through all sorts of uh, ceremonies that are endorsed by um, um, a certain understanding, very conservative understanding of Judaism. But forget that. I mean, the issue of how those people treat women is important. Let's, just, let's be um, focused on the issue. Your rights as a Jew will not be respected. Right? Um, and the point is this. Often reformed Jews prefer not to make too much of a fuss about it. Because they care so much about Zionism. And um, they prefer to ignore not just the um, attack on the rights of Palestinians in the Jewish state, but also the attack on the rights of Jews in order to um, um, not delegitimize the Jewish state. I think in their imagination, they want to say, yes, this is not perfect, but in principle, it could have been differently. And we have to fight for this being differently so that also reformed Jews will be recognized in Israel. This is bad faith. We know, this much I think we know in political theory, the neutrality of the state is necessary to ensure religious freedoms. Where the state is not neutral about religion, it will not give the rights to those people with whom it doesn't agree. Not Palestinians, not reform Jews. The best way to protect the cultural and religious rights of Jews in Israel is to have a state that's not Jewish. This is something that people often forget. Should be also stated clearly. This is also why Zionism, by the way, as a movement that strives to protect the national rights of Jews, would profit from not going, not supporting the idea of a Jewish state. You mean the Israeli state should be neutral when it comes to Zionism? Yes. Hmm. Not when it comes to um, uh, Judaism. Judaism. So if there were, a, a, say, a Haifa Republic, if there were a binational federation with the Palestinians, um, and there were a constitution that's joint to Arabs and Jews, this constitution would have to be neutral. It would have to ensure the full rights of everybody, regardless of their religion. Already built into that would be that the state has no right to attack your um, religious freedoms. Um, and for that reason, um, also the rights of Jews would be better protected. So in the end, let's, before we talk about your binational idea again, um, you call it in your book a utopia. But as I understand you, the preferred two-state solution of Germany, of the Europeans, of basically the rest of the world, you're saying that's the utopia, that's the illusion. Why? Um, yes or no, just to be uh, specific. Mm -hmm. The two-state solution is not a utopia. It's an illusion, just a bad illusion. Um, um, why the two-state solution is an illusion, I can easily say. Um, when people um, argue these days that the two-state solution is over or almost over, they usually begin with a number of settlers who live in the West Bank. I think this is not the place where uh, that discussion has to start. It is part of our um, chauvinism a little bit. We need to start with the Palestinians, not with the settlers. Between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea currently lives a Palestinian majority. Even the most um, generous two-state solution deal to the Palestinians proposes to give this majority of the population approximately 22% of the territory. Now, this type of utopian solution um, is no good, and not just because it is unfair or unjust. It is no good because um, closing the majority of the population in this tiny, crowded, discontinuous, you have Gaza and the West Bank, territory 
is not the type of compromise that can bring peace. And this before we said a word about the settlers. This before we mentioned that on those 22%, there, leaves, there leave 700,000, 650,000, if you want to be, uh, you know, um, uh, Jewish settlers. This is before we mentioned research universities, Israeli, uh, an Israeli research university at the heart of the territory that will never be evacuated. <sighs> Supporting the two-state solution is very similar to supporting or to denying global warming. It is um, unsustained by the facts. People um, spoke about my Haifa Republic as an idea that is unrealistic. We can talk about it later. But speaking about reality, let's begin by admitting reality. And, you know, we, we need to be realist because this is politics. Um, there will not be a two-state solution. Reality check. Um, yeah, what was the next question? Has, has, uh, was the two-state solution never a realistic option? Or are we saying, or are you saying it in 2020, like concerning the present and the future? I think that's an interesting question. An interesting question. I'm not sure how important. There is a debate about this among uh, leftist circles in Israel. Um, like, like, or, like, was it always wrong like, for leftists to like, oh, let's go for a two-state solution? Because it was always... Look, I'm a, a philosophy professor, but this is an academic question. <laughs> I mean, we can ask it. And maybe it will have, but may, and maybe it will have interesting consequences to our thinking. I mean, did you ever believe in a two-state solution? I believe in it, but and I often believe things that are false. And wh wh where did you realize that it was wrong? At some point, there had to be. If you're rational, you have to be open to reality. You have to see that some types of things are not going to happen. I'm not sure what was the moment when I, you know, realized that it ain't going to happen. I think for me, one moment was just realizing, just looking at the map and seeing Ariel. Ariel is a town, 20,000 um, uh, inhabitants at the heart of the West Bank. Um, um, liberal Zionist supporters of the two-state solution often like to say, look, there are many, many um, Israeli settlers. It's true. They will never be evacuated. It's true. But there is a magic solution. And the magic solution is drawing differently the borders. We can have border adjustments. Most settlements are basically on the border of the 67 territory. We adjust the border. We compensate the Palestinians with different areas of land somewhere else. And we have a two-state solution. Sounds great. And I, I think that I used to believe that. At some point, you look at the map. And you see that one of the most prosperous Israeli settlements was located deliberately at the very heart of the West Bank. That's Ariel. A um, couple of years ago, Israel established there its sixth research university. Sheldon Adelson, Trump's uh, big donor, gave the funds now to the establishment of the uh, Adelson School of Medicine in Ariel, you're not going to fix that with border adjustments. Um, for me, that was um, one, when I saw that, when I, not when I saw that, because I've seen that many times, and I realized that. This was one moment when I said, we need to move on. Um, seeing the Palestinians, understanding that the Palestinians also cannot have a two-state solution, because um, there are too many for receiving those 22% that are discontinuous. It's not, it's not going to work. Um, came later. Um, yeah. Why a binational state? Why not a confederation or some kind of other model? I think I talked to Sam Bahur. He's a, Sam Bahur, uh -huh. he's a Palestinian professor, and he was like, I don't like he he was proposing a one-state solution as well, but he was like, I'm open for whatever model, and I was like, wait, there are different models, and he was like, yeah, there's the Swiss model, you know, there are four different uh, types of uh, nationalities or citizens. I'm not married to a um, 
to um that there's a belgian model you know i'm not married to uh um one specific model okay. um i don't think um a confederate i think the way at least i understand the term is the wrong concept the way i understand it because a confederate assumes the pre-existence of the states so a confederate in a way assumes a two-state solution if you can have a confederate you can have a two-state solution w would be like like a small eu you know uh, two two states but you have different sovereign states exactly, exactly. within the eu exactly, so exactly. that's not um um if you can do that uh then you can have a two-state solution the way i understand it confederate is a is a place where you have two um um sovereign states that can actually opt out also i, ju I just wanted to give give that as an example or, or you could say why not a uh, israeli palestinian republic you know with two bundesländer oh no that's the, that's very much the idea that's very much the idea the idea is to have exactly those uh, two separate bundesländer um 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 each of them exercising limited sovereignty national self-determination more or less across uh the 67 border but united between them with a joint constitution and also in that sense their um sovereignty is checked by this constitution because they cannot just do whatever they want yeah. um this constitution should ensure um the f the full first the full citizenship of all um human beings living on that territory it should ensure the national rights of Jews and Palestinians within their respective areas. But since separation is no longer possible, maybe it was never possible, but it's not possible now, this constitution ought to ensure the full freedom of movement on the whole territory, the full economic rights on the full territory, the right to purchase land, the um, uh, right to walk, on the full territory and so forth. Um, in that sense, it is very much like uh, two Bundesländer united between them um, with uh, yeah, a joint constitution. So the, the Knesset would be the, the joint parliament. That's right. That's right. Um, and, and Jerusalem would Jerusalem be? will be the, um, the uh, Jerusalem can be the capital of each. Uh, separately. Of both Bundesländer yeah. and of the... But uh, don't forget Haifa. Uh, 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 yeah. And Haifa that. should have, Haifa should have, you know, that, that's part where it is coming in beautiful imagination. But um, Haifa can have the joint, right? So there should be, for example, a, um, a constitutional court. A constitutional court that ensures that um, the neutral joint constitution is enforced you can sit in Haifa. For example, does it sound to you utopian? It was a question. No. Okay. Also, not to me. And many people uh, thought that this is utopian. I think it's a little sensation about this book that it takes a fact that um, I'll leave it aside. The, uh, um, it takes a fact that's either unknown or known and assumed to be an anecdote, a weird anecdote, and tries to say, look, look, you have to notice it. This was already proposed and voted on and passed. It will not be, diff it will not be easy to return to that, but this is not utopian. This was historical reality in 1977, 78, Menachem Begin, it was mentioned here many times, exactly when he came and gave this speech about apartheid, when he said, you know, we have to offer all Palestinians citizenship. Otherwise, this will be apartheid. In that same speech, this was a moment when he proposed his vision. People sometimes call it the Begin plan or the Begin autonomy plan. This is all mischaracterizations of what Begin proposed. Begin proposed giving all Palestinians full Israeli citizenship, full freedom of movement, full economic rights on the whole territory. I print this in the book, the whole program. The Knesset voted on that program and passed it. 
68 now don't catch me uh, you know uh, we are resp- in a respectable journalistic um, venue 68 or 64 I want to say 68 4 40 abstained 8 against in any case it passed it was then sacked for all sorts of reasons no matter doesn't matter now there is nothing utopian about ideas of this sort they were historical realities by no means will it be difficult to return to them this is much more realistic than speaking of the illusion of the two-state solution yeah, three qu- questions left first of all when I talk to let's say um, not only settlers but right-wing Israelis uh, about the one-state solution there would always come up one argument well We would soon be a minority in our own country. Not soon, they already are. Sorry that I interrupt you, yeah. And then, like, we, uh, the Palestinians would undermine us, they would crush us, and then Israel would dissolve because the Jews would be, you know, a minority. Which is, like, kind of, kind of funny that uh, the same people, uh, like, they are afraid of the race, I mean, they are saying like, okay, we would be treated race, uh, racist. They're afraid to be treated the same way they treat the Palestinians. And I understand them. Because uh, um, the Jews are no better than anybody else and no worse than anybody else. Um, and people are um, uh, justly concerned for a situ- um, 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 that a situation in which uh, Jews will not be on top will be a situation in which uh, Jews are on the bottom. That's a... Um, it's a false dilemma, uh, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, um, it's an understandable worry. And um, there are many other similar worries, by the, by the way, also to Palestinians. The Palestinians are already the majority on the territory. On the other hand, they are so weak in relation to the Israeli state. I mean, they are nowhere near... Uh, in a situation like this, a Haifa Republic like that, what are you going to do about economic power? The Jews, will be able, the Jews will be able to buy Palestine. Um, what are you going to do about it? Serious problems? I think those are the real problems that need to be discussed, solved, in order to promote an alternative to the region. Jews are the minority... What, hold on a second. Yeah. All right. Jews are the, um, are the minority in that state. Needs to be said, and we need to think about it carefully because it's better be a real solution. Um, the answer is that um, there's a constitution, and the constitution is meant to ensure not just the full individual rights of all human beings living on the territory, but also the national rights. Those national rights need to be protected um, the national rights of Jews need to be protected even though they are the minority I know it sounds weird to say this right because people usually think about the region as it's a Jewish state and so forth um, the Palestinian rights will have to be protected from the economic power that the state of Israel has and again will be just be able to buy it you know, um, just be able to buy the territory, just be able to um, completely assert itself. The Haifa Republic is meant in this sense, my imagination of the Haifa Republic is meant in this sense as a half-baked cake. It's supposed to begin a discussion. We need to think how to actually then promote it. What are the exact problems um, that need to be addressed? This is one of them. The worry of those right-wing, not just right-wing, also left-wing Jews, also even me. Um, um, uh, we have serious concerns to our safety, to our way of life. We need to take this, um, um, this question very seriously as we move towards a binational alternative. Do you address it before you become a binational state or... After, afterwards, like you with, with to, elections. Like you, 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 could, you could hold elections and you have your binational state and then you have different parties who are like, okay, this is what we do about the economic power. Before. 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 
because um, um, that's where um, constitutions, depending on your concept of what a democracy is, a constitution is never fully democratic. If your view of democracy is that democratic is whatever people agree about in elections, not my concept of democracy, in any case, it needs to be decided on. Those things, when you go to elections, that thing needs to be pre-decided on in a constitution. And, so uh, you would vote f on a constitution? There will be ways of doing this, and you can vote on a constitution. That would be a real achievement of the Jew Jewish people and the Palestinian people to agree on a constitution that would ensure the rights of everybody. Again, so this is um, the edge of the discussion where it sounds, yeah, good luck with that. Well, yeah, we need a lot of luck with that. That's the most realistic thing that we can do that's democratic. I know that all sorts of horrifying, not just undemocratic, but horrifying alternatives are more realistic. But there is no more realistic alternative that is democratic. And that's, for that reason, that is the alternative you need to fight for. What I learned from, again, from Sam Bahur, the Palestinian professor, like, I will always remember that, because he said, this is the last generation, the generation of Palestinian, like, po powerful Palestinians, like Abbas and his clique, uh, like a PLO, who are going for their own state. Like, after Abbas is dead or not in power anymore, the next generation of Palestinians, if they are smart, They, re they realize first, there will never be a, a sovereign Palestinian state. And second, they turn this question into a civil rights movement. They give up on their own state and basically take your idea or the idea of many and be like, okay, we will never, uh, this occupation will never end. We can never, uh, we can never achieve our uh, own state. We just want to be, we just want to have the same rights. Let's have... Let's have this. Sounds like uh, someone to do politics with and promote this alternative. Yeah. So, which is basically like we have to wait until Abbas and the, the Fatah guys are well. dead. <laughs> Look, I do not wish unwell to anybody no, and no, also no. not to Abbas. But I will say this. If this is what we need to wait for, then we're very lucky because I don't think that Abbas will stay for that long. I think we need to wait for much more. I think it will not be so easy also one, uh, once Abbas uh, goes away. It is not the case that uh, this vacuum would you know, just be filled with the right leadership, not in Israel, not in uh, Palestine. Um, but look at what happens now in Israel. A certain type of politics has ended its course. It is no longer relevant. The liberal Zionist two-state solution is no longer relevant, and it is for this reason that the liberal Zionist parties disappeared. They've done some good. They've fought for peace. They've fought for uh, rights. They've fought against the occupation. They've done some bad in that they sucked all the possibilities of speaking about an alternative. Also when an alternative was already desired. Their disappearance is a good thing for Israeli politics because it makes possible again precisely the talk about an alternative, which we see with a joint list. The Arab-Israeli party that now receives a lot of support from Jews because um, it is the liberal party in Israel's party. Are they promoting the binational state? Um, good question. Officially not. Unofficially, they are the model of joint politics, of binational politics, right? This is actually something that I'm writing about also. Uh, they need to be pushed just a little bit um, in order to already speak about binationalism explicitly, because when Jews and Arabs run in the same party together, there is no point in speaking about separation. What does it mean to say, let's separate Arabs and Jews? You're running in the same party. You're not even having a Jewish and an Arab party running, you know, making a deal. It's the same party. Um, the joint list is a model of binationalism. I mention this because 
there can be a similar movement with a bus. When a bus disappears, it can happen that in this vacuum, you will have new opportunities. Um, it will not be that easy. It is not just that we need to wait to a bus. That would then be, my God, very soon, uh, if you ask me. Um, uh, not young, not naive, and not healthy. Um, yeah. Like, let's say there, there is going to be a binational state, as you imagine. Like, one f the final question, like, would you still call it Israel? <laughs> it's a great question. I do not know what we would call it. Um, and it's a great question because it shows how difficult the situation is. And um, obviously it cannot be just called Israel. And it shows you, it reveals the problem because it would be very difficult to convince people to move away from that. Um, why not calling the Jewish part Israel? And the Palestinian part, Palestine, um, Palestine. The Bundesland, YouTube. yeah, and uh, the joint one state, Palestel, Bundesrepublik Palestel, something like that. By the way, just that we are in the clear. <laughs> um, the name is not invented by me. Sarin Seiber. I don't know if you ever you did not interview him when you were in the region. He is a wonderful philosophy professor who used to support the one state solution. Then became um, 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 an advisor of Arafat because he wanted to have peace. So he said, even, I, even if I support the one-state solution, I will support with Arafat the two-state solution and we will promote it. I think he gave up on the two-state solution again. He uh, came up with that name as a way of saying, forget the name because it's a silly name. Um, um, I think what's so genius about that name is to say the problem of the name is very difficult on the one hand, But it shows you how silly it is on the other. It is the name. Omri, thanks so much. I think we oh, did more than two hours, Tyler. So much, Tyler. Probably smoking outside. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks so much. It was, that was wonderful. And uh, let's do this again sometime. Absolutely. And maybe let's not wait until there is this uh, binational <laughs> state. Because I think... This could still take a while. Yes. Thanks, Aubrey. Thanks Thank so you. much for watching and listening to this. Bye.